I guess, hosted webinar. Uh, my name is Karen Pank. I have uh, been honored to serve as the executive director for CPOC for the last uh, 14 years. Uh, prior to that, I spent uh, most of my uh, career, the first part of my career in public safety policy making at the state government level, uh, both uh, for the legislature and then for Governor Schwarzenegger. Um, I'm pleased to be your facilitator today. So uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, celebrating Women's History Month here in March, it really has given us an amazing opportunity uh, to really stop and recognize the important role women play in probation. Uh, frankly, we do not do this enough. Um, and that's in, uh, kind of the problem of today, right? We don't toot our own horns enough. So we, we wanna start changing that starting today. Uh, women make up 51% of the probation officers in California. Uh, it's an amazing statistic. Uh, we have 10 uh, of the 18 current women chiefs here today uh, to share some of their perspective. But before we look ahead um, and what we can do for women in the profession, we should look back a bit. And while the numbers today are kind of eye popping, um, they really shouldn't be. Um, this is not a complete review of the history that would probably take the full 90 minutes we have today or longer, but uh, a few news of note. Uh, there was a woman chief in Orange County as early as 1930, and several uh, women chief have held that position in that county since then. One in particular that actually took me under her wing my very first day as the executive director at CPOC. Uh, it was also just shared with me just uh, yesterday that uh, really a trail was blazed in uh, out of San Diego County probation by uh, that forward thinking administration uh, in the 1990s that really reinvented how we work with juveniles. Many of those tools that we're employing today, um, both here in the state of California, as well as around the country, was really uh, pioneered uh, in San Diego and really uh, set us on a great foundation. I can tell you personally, as I came to work for probation, uh, it was really a stark contrast to other statewide associations um, to have the opportunity to sit at the table with as many women chief um, and then many going on to serve as president of our association is uh, truly uh, amazing and something that I think we all take great pride in. Um, I, it's unfortunate that it seems like that is the exception and not the norm, but I think that might not be true here in probation. I think that we are seeing a lot of women uh, leaders and a lot of you here uh, participating in this webinar are good examples of that. And we can't forget that this doesn't happen without uh, the support um, being seen as equals and valuable to both men and women in our profession. And uh, I know I've been fortunate to have both a strong male and female mentors in my life. Um, all that said, at times it can be difficult for women in this profession. Um, it is still sometimes seen as a male dominated one. And so while obstacles exist, uh, it is good to hear and share um, experiences from other women in the profession to recharge our batteries and provide us some inspiration. So I'm really fortunate to work for those women here today to share their stories with you. Uh, I get to, to deal and uh, hear a lot of that firsthand. Um, it, it's a pleasure for me to facilitate this conversation. Uh, so I want to thank you for joining us. A um, couple of logistics before we get started. Uh, we appreciate uh, many of you have sent in questions ahead of time, and that gave us a little bit of time to go through those and try to work them into the program. Um, and we also have a Q&A function that we will hopefully be able to pull some um, further questions from as well. Uh, but we only have 90 minutes today, so I suspect we won't be able to get through all of them, but we will try to do our best. So the plan here is, as I said, we have 10 uh, chiefs here today. So we'll go through one by one um, and pose a question to uh, one of them, introduce them, and, uh, and then open up uh, questions a little more broadly. Uh, chiefs, for those of you who are on the panel, uh, we'll 
go ahead and um, after we go through each of our questions, I'll direct new questions to one or two of you uh, just to try to uh, be able to get through as many as we possibly can. Um, as I call on you, if there was something that you really felt passionate about and you wanted to go back and answer um, but weren't uh, called on for a particular question, please feel free to, to jump in and, and share what you feel might be important today. And finally, we're recording today's session, so uh, that will give us an opportunity to share it uh, after uh, knowing that not everybody who probably would have interest in seeing and hearing some of the important things that we'll be talking about today, um, another opportunity to do so. So with that, let's jump in. They don't even know who I'm going to call on first, so everybody's probably sitting at the edge of their seats and um, wondering if they if they uh, picked the lucky straw. The lucky straw. I'd like to um, I'd like to introduce a, a, a chief that already um, has kind of touched on this subject. We were talking about it uh, last night. Um, she had made some uh, comments to one of our managers leadership academy. Uh, and really sparked uh, some, uh, some reactions that kind of led into this March uh, celebration of women uh, when she talked about her path uh, uh, to Contra Costa County. So um, I'll, I'll start off by being vulnerable right out of the gate and share something that I probably haven't shared with, with uh, Chief. Uh, I, I probably mess up saying your name every single time. Do I not, Chief? <laughs> so go ahead and unmute. Most people do. It's fine. Most people do. <laughs> I'm not the only one. All right. So, so, uh, so Chief, make sure I don't mispronounce it. Will you say it for us? Certainly. Issa Eamon Krause. Thank you, Chief Eamon Krause. Um, actually, one of the things that we had asked before we jump into the um, serious questions and topics of today, I like to make sure people get a chance to get to know the, the person behind the important issues. Um, and so while, while Chief Eamon Krause is um, it currently in Contra Costa, she also worked in uh, Alameda beforehand. This is her first year as chief, right? And um, as marked by the pandemic, which is pretty interesting. Uh, and uh, her favorite quote, which I particularly love because I feel like it also describes my everyday um, existence, not all those who wander are lost. I like that. I'm going to take that to heart. Um, and what she wanted to do when she grew up was to be an investigative journalist. So very interesting. So I'd, I'd like to, to see how uh, one ended up in probation from there. But uh, one of the, the questions we were hoping to start with is what words of wisdom would you share with women looking to advance in this field? Um, and how can they make the most impact in the role that they currently have? Thank you, Karen, and great question. And I have to say, when I was thinking about it, a few different things came to mind. So I will try and keep it brief. So all of, all of the amazing chiefs on the panel today have, have ample time to speak, but a couple of things really came to mind. And one of the first ones, interestingly enough, was a quote that was on a, um, a, water, a water bottle that my daughter got me for Christmas a few years ago that said, you grow through what you go through. And I think that that really kind of summed up my career trajectory nicely. I think everything I've been through just put me in position for the next right step. And I have to say, before I really share words of wisdom, I have really been fortunate to have amazing female leaders throughout my career. So as some of the other chiefs and I were talking last night, um, the idea of being the first female chief in Contra Costa County, the magnitude of that was really lost on me because throughout my career, I've had amazing female leaders. Um, so uh, I, I'm excited to be the first female chief. And, and as I shared at the MLA graduation, it is my intention to pave the way to make sure I'm not the last female chief and that there are a, a long series of female chiefs behind me here in Contra Costa County. Um, but my words on wisdom are really this. I really feel like you need to take calculated risks. You need to continue to challenge yourself. So if you're feeling too confident in your abilities or too comfortable with your routine daily tasks, it's probably time to seek change. Seek change in assignments, seek change in working location, um, push yourself to maybe interview or apply for a promotion that you don't know if you're quite ready for. Um, because I feel like when you start to become too stagnant and too complacent, 
um, you're not pushing yourself to move forward enough. Another piece of wisdom that I used to share when I would participate in mentoring programs uh, to the, the people that were coming up and that I was mentoring was always try to say yes more than you say no. So say yes to new assignments and opportunities and training, because that's how you create those unexpected connections for yourself and you gain exposure for yourself to really create those avenues to progress. And I'll also say watch the trends and become the subject matter expert, become that reliable go-to person that your leadership is turning to, um, that your network of peers in other jurisdictions are turning to, to really follow those trends and see how you can get in front of being the subject matter expert. And then get comfortable taking up space. So patriarchal working environments and toxic masculinity are absolutely unavoidable, but you need to be just as comfortable being the first one to share your opinion, the first one to voice opposition, the first one to utilize healthy professional discord to your advantage, and don't ever forget that your contributions are just as important and that you deserve credit for your thoughts and your ideas and the work that you do. And then lastly, and I think Karen touched on this a little bit, is find mentors and seek mentors that aren't necessarily within our industry. I had some really remarkable mentors outside of probation that really drove me to where I'm at now. Um, I was running a system of care um, initiative in a, in a community mental health center in Northern Indiana it was a SAMHSA funded grant initiative and that kind of dates myself uh, in the early 2000s. And I'd worked for the Department of Correction and I'd worked for probation early on a little bit doing some placement work and obviously as a, as a juvenile correctional officer years and years ago in college. Uh, but I really had kind of put myself on a path to go into community mental health, but working with this system of care and working with the probation chief in the community I was serving really opened my eyes to all of the amazing work of probation beyond just what I knew from the county I'd worked in early on, uh, the prevention work, the diversion work that really was integral to the work we do. Um, and so even though I spent a, a good chunk of my career working in corrections, I knew that being on the front end of things was also something that I would be really passionate about. So again, find those mentors and, and sometimes they may be in very unexpected spaces as well. Thank you, Steve. That was very helpful and uh, a good way to kick off the discussion. So uh, moving to uh, the other end of the state, we'll uh, uh, go next to uh, Chief uh, Tanya Hart Heitman, who will um, kind of express her uh, expertise in 30 plus years in probation, three plus years as chief, which I would have guessed if anybody had asked me that that was double that based on probably the amount of work we often uh, send your way from CPOC. Um, your favorite quote was, the sure way to miss success is to miss the opportunity, which um, I, I love as we uh, talk about often around our office that if, uh, if I come to you with uh, a great opportunity, <laughs> that usually means a, a lot of work that comes behind that. Um, you, uh, your answer to the question about what you thought you might want to be when you grew up uh, was rather lengthy, so I won't read that as that can be kind of uh, problematic in these kind of forums, but it did carry a common theme. You wanted to work with children. We hear that a lot, obviously, from a lot of people who are drawn to probation, so uh, that may be a little bit of a clue as to some of your comments. Uh, but the question we had for you, and please feel free to add other thoughts as you will, but what were the best resources and support for you throughout your career to help you get where you are today? Thank you, Karen. Um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be on the panel today with such a great uh, team of other women leaders in the uh, probation field. Uh, as you said, this is really, uh, you know, we have a long history of it, of uh, women in leadership, but the um, scale has tipped in our favor across the board in positions in probation. And I'm very proud of that. And I'm proud of all of the, the women across the state that are contributing to the field. And I really have to kind of build upon what Issa just shared. Um, you know, for my quote in terms of seizing those opportunities as well as 
uh, what has probably impacted me most um, across my career is saying yes when you wanted to say no, um, agreeing to a new challenge or a new opportunity uh, when you didn't weren't sure you were ready for it and you weren't really sure you wanted to do it. I've had the benefit of um, being, have my arm twisted, if you will, at times uh, to get me to take on a new assignment or a new challenge um, that I wasn't so sure about. And um, those times when I reluctantly said yes and thought, oh, I'm just gonna have to kind of uh, get through this. I'm, I'm not gonna enjoy it. I don't think I'm going to benefit from this experience, but I, I just have to do it. I've really proven to be um, those assignments that I learned the most from, that I uh, gained the most um, uh, wisdom from, uh, had opportunity to develop new skills and found that um, I enjoyed the most. Uh, and I think that that's a part of um, you know, our, our success as leaders as well is when we're willing to step out, take a risk, and um, do something uh, bold. And I would encourage all the women um, that are with us today uh, to step out and, and be bold. And you may make some mistakes along the way, but that's okay. That's the way that we learn. Um, if you are finding that you're comfortable in your position and what you've been doing, then you're probably really not um, giving you know, your, your full um, value to the organization and to the field. It's when you're feeling a little bit wobbly and unsure and you're trying to, to test out some new skills um, that you probably are gonna learn the most and benefit the most. And those mentors that can encourage you to do that and prop you up when you need it um, are the ones that uh, I, I found um, very helpful over the course of, of my career. Those that could be honest and let you know when you had um, some shortcomings that you needed to work on. Um, didn't necessarily want to hear it always, uh, but can truly say that I benefited from it. And I'm glad that there were those um, around me that were willing to be honest with me, as well as encourage me and kind of prop me up along the way. So um, I, I know that uh, some of it is kind of uh, same message as, as what Issa shared, but I think that that is kind of the wisdom behind it is when you're hearing those things, um, from various leaders, you really do have to stop and think, um, am I fully uh, uh, benefiting from their advice? So uh, be bold is what I would say. I like that. Well, I say I like that, but you're very good advice because actually nobody really likes to be told to be bold. It is a very, um, can be very uh, scary, right? But the but that is how we move forward. That's how we learn and uh, important advice for, for probably women more so than ever at a time like now. So thank you for sharing that, Chief. Uh, Chief Fletcher uh, from a San Francisco adult, uh, we, we share a lot in common, uh, one, our names, which I, you know, I don't know a ton of Karen, so I always find that really great, uh, so I appreciate that. Uh, the other thing uh, we shared is that you thought you wanted to be a lawyer when you grew up, so that's, that is, uh, that is also very uh, interesting. You have 31 years in probation, and I'm sure I will get a, uh, a talking to by all of the chiefs after this to say, why did you make me tell them how long I've been in the profession? And so I apologize up front. Um, but I, I, I said how long I had been working for you guys, which I had to ask for, uh, for help in remembering. Um, Years as a chief, six, so that's that's uh, quite some time uh, for, uh, that you've been with us, and in uh, really we appreciate that. But also, interestingly enough, you have also been in a couple of different counties, Santa Clara and now San Francisco, and a short time at the federal probation level. So uh, that's a that's a new twist. Another favorite quote: "Well-behaved women seldom make history." I love that one. So tell us why is it important to have women leaders in probation? Thanks, Karen. And, and this is such a great platform to be able to share information with my colleagues um, on this call, but with 
all of the staff out there in, in probation that are looking for um, opportunities. Um, so I thank you very much for, for putting this together. You know, probation and corrections historically was very male dominated. Um, and now we know that 51% of probation officers are female. Um, so we've come a tremendous way in the history of probation. You know, when I began my career in 1989, some of the female mentors that I had would tell me about the times when they were hired and they would only be allowed to work with kids on the juvenile side, that they didn't think women could appropriately engage with adults um, on probation. So we've made tremendous strides and I think it really is about the skill set that women bring to the industry. Um, we have unique skills and we certainly use them to better serve the population and the families that we serve in the community, but also our staff. Um, you know, the collaboration that we bring, the communication skills, the empathy, um, the inclusion, the calming nature that I don't always have, but <laughs> we do have generally. Um, we do bring that to the table to bring people together. We create environments that are supportive. And not to say that our male counterparts in probation don't offer some of those same skills, but I think coming from the perspective of a female in this industry is so important. And we really do have the opportunity to nurture people and to pull people forward, um, to really give advice, to, to support people in a way that, that comes just from a different perspective. Um, but I think overall, it's about the balance, right? Um, our industry has shifted over the years um, to being more about corrections and punishment into a more um, rehabilitative and supportive environment. And I think women play that key role in that effort. So bringing that balance to the table and that collaboration, not just with the partners in public safety, um, but really engaging the clients and our staff to know that they're there is a way to um, really work in this field and do it in a very caring and supportive manner. So I think, you know, women come at it from so many different perspectives. And I think our unique life experiences really add into that. So I think it's incredibly important to have the balance and uh, female leadership in community corrections. Thank you, Chief. That's very helpful. You know, um, our next chief, you know, it, it kind of takes us, as I was just thinking around the state, what's really fascinating too about this, this panel that just dawned on me, we have women as leaders and sitting as chiefs all around the state, all in all different uh, corners, which is really uh, great to see as well. And so we'll take a trip to the Central Valley with uh, Chief Kelly Zuniga. Um, and she has been in probation 29 and a half years, but who's counting? <laughs> um, six years as chief, so another six year. Um, counties you've worked in is mainly Kings, but took a little trip to Fresno for, for a moment, it, it looks like. Uh, I would uh, also love, I love the quote, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. Eleanor Roosevelt, absolutely true. And something we always have to keep in mind, sometimes more so as women than, uh, than our counterparts. Uh, I think the, um, I'm going to share the fun fact. We did ask for fun facts. I haven't shared everybody's fun fact, uh, but this one is a good one. Kings County probation has the highest ratio of women officers in the state. That's that's pretty good. I, I, I like that other eye popping uh, fact. So Chief Zuniga, your question, what are, were the greatest challenges you faced in advancing your career? And how do you think the probation profession has changed since then? Thank you, Karen, and um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to everybody on the importance of women in probation. Um, I think one of the biggest obstacles when I started was the fact that I think it was difficult to be taken seriously as a woman in the profession. Uh, when I came to the county, uh, my, my short little stint in Fresno County was as an extra health PO, and then I came to Kings County. 
um, not knowing what I didn't know. And I was young, the youngest person in the department by about a decade. Um, and it was tough for people to want to take me seriously, I think. Um, I think real quickly about a story. I was maybe two months into my tenure here. We were on a search and one of the uh, sergeants at our sheriff's office, who I respected and had known basically all my life since I grew up in this county, he walked by me because I was just kind of standing there dumbfounded by what was going on and the, the magnitude of what I was doing. And he called me Chrissy. And I determined right then and there, I would never be called Chrissy again. And I dug in and like the other chiefs have said, I took those assignments nobody else wanted. I asked to be transferred to places nobody else wanted to go. Um, and I think that that helped me get over that. And very quickly, I think I built my reputation where Christy would never come in, uh, maybe some other adjectives, but probably not Chrissy ever again. So um, I think now the difference being that the field of probation welcomes female officers. Um, I take a lot of pride in knowing, and I didn't know until just recently, that we did have the highest percentage of women uh, of any other department. But I think that speaks volumes, considering Kings County to be a very conservative county. Um, I'm the only female chief around the public safety chief's table. So um, it, it makes me feel good to know that I won't be the last female chief for sure, like Lisa talked about. Um, I want to pave the way for another woman to come in and, and advance the department far beyond what I could possibly do. But I think that's the difference, that we're readily accepted into the field now. That's a great point. And isn't it always the case? It seems like a, a something I, I've always felt has been true uh, about uh, about women and no matter what you, you what you tackle you you have to be a little bit faster smarter better you know to make your mark take the bold um you know choices as was uh, previously mentioned so uh it, it really puts uh you in the pathway for success and leadership and uh so what might be seen as a challenge actually sometimes forges the best leaders so thank you for sharing Moving again around the state, I'd like to uh, to introduce you to Chief Jennifer Branning. Uh, Chief, you uh, have uh, been in probation for 13 years and a chief as eight, which um, I actually remember having a conversation with you when you were kind of considering this uh, and would you really want to do this? And so it feels uh, feels like uh, time does go by really quickly. Um, and your um, fun fact was that you picked Lassen County from a map based on the environment and moved there from Jackson, Wyoming. So isn't that... Uh, Talk about bold choices, you know, just let your your uh, mind wander. And clearly that's also uh, explains your de-stress activity of paddle boarding, <laughs> which we all know and love about you uh, around our chief table. So uh, uh, Chief Branning, your question is, what is the hardest lesson you've had to learn during your career? Well, thank you. That's a great question. And I also want to thank you for the honor of being able to present here today with my colleagues who are just um, some of the most amazing people in the world. The amazing women at CPOC, the amazing women within our department here in Lassen County, and the amazing women in probation all over the place. I uh, feel honored for that. Um, one thing that was very hard for me to learn as a very new leader. Uh, I, I was a super, I was a, made a supervisor in a different profession, and you know I just always admired so many people, and I had a great uh, manager, and I just wanted to be so much like her, you know, because she was just super amazing. And probably two weeks after I was promoted, uh, she said, "What in the world are you doing?" And I said, "I, you know, I don't know. What do you mean? What am I doing? I'm just I'm doing my job. I'm going to be just like you." She said, "You can't be. You have to be yourself." That's what's great is that you have to be yourself and that's a good supervisor. So I had to walk away from that and I had to learn, oh my goodness, what's the teaching moment? 
And that was developing my own leadership style, how I wanted to do that and how I wanted to teach and lead other women, other people, be a mentor, help them and let them grow. So I had to really learn how to make my style and make my style different. And within that, you know, um, I think Chief Heitman said it, we all make mistakes and we learn from those. Well, when we make those mistakes, one thing I found that was the next challenge is how to be kind to myself. When I made those mistakes, I would beat myself up and I had to learn how to take that language and turn it around, be kind to myself and say, hey, what did you learn from this? What did you learn? What are you gonna do next in this situation? And how do you not repeat the same mistake? So I think those for me were really important. And the most difficult things in the world to do is just to be myself, to trust in myself and to be kind to myself. Thank you, Chief. And, you know, I actually neglected to also share with our audience um, in your introduction that you serve as our secretary treasurer, which means that you are on a pathway. I'm not sure if you knew this when you agreed to do so to be our president in, in two years. And so we're very excited about that. I'm very excited about that as well. Um, uh, I can also say that it's uh, one of those things where like Chief Heitman, you know, said it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit wobbly on my knees, but I know I have amazing people to help hold me up and to make sure that um, we always move forward and do an amazing job. Yeah. Well, we're, we are very glad you said yes to being bold and uh, we really look forward to your tenure as, as our president. Um, the, uh, the next uh, chief is uh, one that um, I have known and had the opportunity to work with um, pre-chief, pre-probation. Uh, she has extensive state experience in addition to her time in county land. And uh, that is uh, Chief Wendy Still from uh, Alameda. Uh, you have an extensive history, as I say, in both at the state level and in corrections, and then also kind of looking at it from the county level. So I feel a little bit akin to, to your journey going from the state to county work. And, uh, and I'm sure uh, you have a very fondness for the fact that uh, we landed in, in county land uh, and, and were able to do a lot of your work there. Your favorite quote is also one of mine as we came to realize as we were preparing for this uh, webinar, do not go where the path may lead, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. I'm not sure I've ever heard a quote that so perfectly defines the person whose quote it is a favorite of than you, Chief Still. That really does does describe you to a T. And uh, and it's uh, been wonderful to have you at our table. I know you are also one who will be uh, looking at uh, at. Uh, not being at our table and that makes it uh, sad as people retire but it also is a good opportunity to talk to those of you in our uh, in our audience that this is why it's important for you to to keep pushing yourself we always need to replenish uh, great leaders um, I will also add that I think your want what you wanted to do when you grew up was also fascinating to me for a stranger you don't hear that every day. So uh, so with that, uh, Chief Still, I will pose the question, what challenges do you think remain for women in probation today? And what do you think uh, could or should be done to address them? Well, thank you very much, Karen, for inviting me to be part of this esteemed panel. You know, the women on this panel and the other uh, eight women that are not represented here as chiefs are, are just absolutely amazing, you know, and I, I think now is, is a really good time for us to be talking to the future leaders who those are the women that are on this call that are interested, right, in becoming, I think, the future leaders. Um, in terms of the obstacles, I would say right now we're, it, we're in a state of historic change. Seems like we've been that way since 2010 and realignment, right? And I, and I think the skills that are needed now are much different than they had been in the past. And so I think it's a huge opportunity for women. I agree with what somebody said relative to, you know, the, the path really to leadership positions is saying yes, right? And taking on those roles that are, are not the ones that everybody want or taking on the assignment that others want you to take, but you really didn't know whether or not you had the skills, right? But other people had um, had the faith in you. 
And so uh, I think the biggest, some of the biggest challenges are going to be is, is keeping knowledgeable about where our field is at, you know, therapeutic interventions, mental health, SUD, you know, the, the whole juvenile, the transformation. I think those are going to be the challenges is really to keep pace with that and knowledgeable about what's going on nationally, not just locally, right, but what's happening on a national scale and, in, and being aware of that. So you are the subject matter expert in the room. And I think also um, a challenge will be with your other public safety partners, as well as your behavioral health, your health partners and such, is um, being able to be the voice in the room that helps your partners move along with as progressive as probation is, right? Knowing the other public safety partners in the room is certainly generally the presiding judge, the district attorney, and the um, uh, the district attorney and other electeds like the sheriff. And, and they are electeds, right? So they are deferred to in many, in many venues, right? And being comfortable in yourself to be able to have your opinion, to take your seat at the table and not be afraid to have your voice heard because that's really important. And that's what's gonna move your organization. You know, your probation is at a crossroads too. We're either gonna thrive or with this whole pushback on law enforcement, right? You know, in terms of defund police, we need to make sure that, that we're separating ourselves from that and help educate locally within the community. What's our value add? Who are we? What do we do? Which we just go out there and do really great work, but we don't tell our story enough. And I think that will be one of the challenges. But I think, you know, women have the skills, you know, which is the listening skills, also the, the communication skills. There's a study I love, you know, it's an older study now, but for every one word that a man says, women speak seven words, right? And so uh, anyways, uh, I think it's a great time for women in potential leadership positions. And I look forward to seeing the successes. I am retiring next month after 40 years. So it's time for that next generation of leaders and there'll be a ton of opportunities as many of us now will begin to retire. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, really appreciate that. And definitely a good shout out to, uh, to have folks um, be thinking about, you know, pushing themselves into those leadership positions. Um, our, our next chief I'd like to introduce you to, uh, Chief uh, Tracy Neal has uh, from Shasta is uh, 24 years in probation, almost seven years as a chief. She's uh, had the opportunity to serve in a, a couple of different um, counties, which always uh, I think is interesting to, to see because uh, we do have such diverse uh, experiences in those counties. So Humboldt, uh, Mono, and now Shasta. Um, I, I always think of Chief Neal as one of the toughest, uh, you know, uh, chiefs on our block, uh, so to speak. She really has, uh, has to always, uh, you know, fight for probation and and, uh, and does so so eloquently. So I have to say, I was, uh, I always love the fun fact that she um, also added to it, which is uh, she loves to sew, stitch and quilt. And uh, I do actually share a lot of that as well. I'm nowhere near as, uh, as good as she is by it, but I, I definitely think those types of things help you relax. And that's an important thing for women, especially to keep in mind to find those, uh, those outlets. Uh, so Chief Neal, a uh, question for you. Can you talk about your general advice for career advancement and taking your seat at this table? Sure. Thank you, Karen, and thanks um, for having me on the panel today. You know, with sewing and quilting and stitching, it's all about patterns, right? In what your eye can see, in, in measuring, in being strategic. And so I think there's a lot of similarities um, that I think makes me a, a great leader when I think about some of my hobbies and how I spend my time. Um, you know, I think when I think about your question, the biggest you know, piece of it is I think what's super important for um, career advancement and what women need to be thinking is thinking globally. 
Um, you know, we often think probation, public safety, or courts, we often think about those partners, but there are so many other partners out there in our community, and there is so much benefit to getting to know those partners, understanding their work, understanding how um, we connect and our work interact, you know, in interacts. Um, you know, it's important because, you know, you want to know what funding is out there, how a decision you make in probation could impact something at first five or something at public health, or even with the school board. And I think doing that work and really getting to understand those connections is so important. Um, you know, because a lot of times you make a decision or somebody, you know, a leader in your department makes a decision and you don't really understand understand the impact um, or when it rolls out, how it does impact other areas of the field. Um, you know, as well as I think there's a lot of funding streams out there that, you know, you're not aware of unless you're partnering. Um, recently, I partnered with um, our first five um, leader and we were able to bring in some great training. Um, and it's not a partner that I would normally think of. Um, and so I think that's important. Um, I think when you think globally in your community and even on a state level, it, it gives you an advantage to understanding political climates um, in where you can be more riskier and where you need to be safer, where you can align. Um, and so I think that's really important. Um, you know, as well as you don't wanna work in a silo. There's a lot of great stuff that needs to be done in our community and a lot of areas to advance. And I think when you're thinking globally and just outside of your normal box allows you to be creative and do a lot of good work in the community and, and make the most impact. Um, you know, and as you're thinking globally, I think it allows you to build partnerships in relationships with people in the community, um, which you got to do that work. You have to um, have relationships and, and build those with others in your community. Um, you got to do it on the front end because at some point you may need to partner with them or you may need some assistance or you may have somebody come out of the woodwork that you partnered with at the public health board that, you know, is talking probation all of a sudden at a school board meeting. Um, and so it's just really important. Um, a few other areas that I think are um, good areas to focus on for career advancements is having goals um, and setting pathways, um, being able to talk about your passion, being able to talk about probation, um, you know, to others, I think is very important. Um, being able to talk um, about the data and the good work, um, I think in a passionate way is important. And I like, um, I think I've heard it a, a couple from a couple different people, you, you have to take chances. Um, you know, being a leader in probation is isn't safe. It's not a safe area. And sometimes you aren't the most popular person in the room and you have to be bold. You have to be, you know, take those chances and you have to challenge others, um, you know, where sometimes you're going to feel uncomfortable. Um, so I think those are the areas that I think are important for people thinking about um, wanting to be leaders in the field, um, you know, for them to think about. As usual, all great points. <laughs> so, um, and I love the story about you know patterns and and kind of the it, that for the very first time it makes so much sense to me and it can be my good excuse when my my husband laughs at me for sitting in the corner and doing something related to sewing. Uh, I could say. It, it's for my job. I need to be thinking strategically. So, uh, so that that is uh, good advice. That's something I can take away with me. Uh, our next uh, chief uh, I'd like to introduce is uh, Chief Julie Baptista from Napa. I think we probably share a, uh, a, a mentor um, uh, over the years, and uh, so I, I feel also a kinship to her. She has 25 years in probation and a year and two months uh, as a chief. So, uh, so one of our, our newer uh, additions to our table. Um, you've worked in both Contra Costa and Napa. Uh, I 
I really love the fun fact that you can whistle through your fingers louder than anyone you know. We won't ask you to do that here because I don't know in the virtual environment how that will go on Zoom. So we're going to take your word for it. But that sounds like something once we're back in person, we might have to test out. Um, and what you thought you wanted to be when you grew up was an art teacher. So sticking with our arts and crafts theme here, this is an interesting pattern. Uh, so uh, Chief Baptiste, I turn it over to you with your question. I guess that'd be good if I asked it. Um, what is the importance of mentorship in the field? How does one go about identifying and engaging with a mentor? Thank you, Karen, and uh, and thank you for having me on this panel. I look around at the uh, at my colleagues, and I am honored and humbled to be to be here with uh, on this panel. Um, as you said, I'm one of the newest chiefs here, although that's I'm moving up quickly. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm happy for those following behind me, but I'm also sad to see a lot of experience go out of the room and and. Uh, and that kind of ties into your question about, about mentorship and a lot of the other chiefs spoke to it as well. And I, it's just, it is absolutely essential to have a mentor and, uh, and ideal to have more than one mentor. Uh, I, uh, I look back over my career and I've had, I've had many and some of those mentors, I, I don't know that I really knew they were mentors at the time, just people I really had a, a great deal of respect for and, and watched and learned from. I've had mentors that I have chosen myself and asked to mentor me. I've had, um, I've had mentors assigned to me. Uh, and, and just even now I, I, I look around and I just, I listening to the wisdom in this room and, and I just have all these questions that I, that I want to ask these, the, the, the women here that have had so much experience. Um, I, I think when you choose a mentor, you, it's really important. And, and a couple of the other chiefs touched on that. It's, it, it's, it's vital that you find someone that has different, different views and different style from you and the wisdom to recognize your emerging style if you're early in your career and can can really work with you to bring that out and and someone that that can really help you learn from the experiences that they have and and help you recognize when you should learn from the experiences uh, of, of your own uh, someone can challenge you and, and gently point out your mistakes or sometimes not so gently. I've, I've had that experience as well. Uh, when you choose a mentor, I, I would recommend, for me, I look for someone that I, that I have a lot of respect for. And, uh, and then I, I encourage people to think about who you seek out. When, when I worked closely with, uh, with foster youth, we used to ask them a question to help them. Who do, who do you call? Who do you call if you need a ride? Or who do you call if you need advice? Or who do you call if you need money? Or who do you call if you've done something you're not proud of? And I, I, I think when, when, we pe when we choose a mentor, we should, look, we should ask ourselves similar questions. Who, who do you call for different, different situations? And, and I think that can, that can help us guide uh, guide our choices so that we have someone that really helps helps round us out. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's really where I, I would say it's just it's important and have a lot of mentors for different areas. They're just in in probation. There are so there's just a wealth of experience and knowledge and uh, and willingness for people to to help promote others in this career. So. That is uh, really good advice. I think, you know, sometimes we think, oh, you need a mentor, right? You know, who's going to have all the answers? You know, I don't think any one of us knows one person that has all of the answers or all the answers you'll need. So, um, and to, to be to be yourself, as, as Chief Branning was saying, you know, and, and not do it just the way your mentor might, you know, it's helpful to have more than, than one in that part of the process. That's really good advice. 
Thank you. Uh, moving to uh, a chief who, who always says, oh, you must hate it when my cell number comes up on your on your phone, but it's quite the opposite. I love to get uh, to sit and talk about the question at hand and then the the 10 things that we talk about after because I always feel smarter after I get off the phone with uh, Chief Laura Garnett from Santa Clara County, who is uh, next up on our list here. And she has 32 years in probation, six as chief. Those are the class of six, I realize that must have been a special year or something was in the water for, for the women chief at the six year mark. Um, she has served in uh, Santa Cruz and Santa Clara. Um, her favorite quote, which is something I feel like uh, it really also um, feels very much like something I, I should be living every day. Do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. <laughs> I feel like that is definitely uh, the, the time frame uh, we are in these days. And what you thought you wanted to be when you grew up was a veterinarian and then a pilot. That says a lot about our Chief Garnett. So uh, Chief, your question, what are three things you wish someone would have told you at the start of your career? And if I had to put money on it, you might have five. Okay, that's just scary because I have exactly five. So that's freaky. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for um, including me. And I, I also feel very honored to be um, surrounded by such um, esteemed colleagues. So um, just real quick, I, I was going to be a pilot. So I didn't apply to college because I took the Air Force test and I did super well on it. And so that was my plan until um, they told me that females couldn't be pilots but I was welcome to join the Air Force and they would give me a lot of things, but I couldn't fly planes. So that was um, discouraging and I'm only 56. So that was not that long ago. Um, so partially because of that experience, um, here's, here's the things that I would, I would say. Um, don't hide or minimize who you are to help others be more comfortable. If you're a parent, don't be afraid to talk about and prioritize your kids. If you fall on the LGBT spectrum, don't be afraid to say that. Don't let other people's uncomfortableness define you. I think for women, that's uh, something that we just all need to remind ourselves every day. Um, clients are experts on themselves. Honoring that, listening to them and supporting their healing is as much community safety as a search that results in gun seizures. Um, Camaraderie is extremely important, but your integrity and reputation is the most important. So if you make a mistake, tell the truth, own it and move on. Never compromise this. Surround yourself with people who trust, who you trust to tell you the truth, not the gossip, but the truth. Don't be swayed by funding opportunities or political pressure. Know what your values are and don't compromise them. Compromise everything else, but not your values. People respect that even if they don't disagree, if they disagree. And finally, everything is supposed to change and improve and we should change too. And that's a strength and not a deficit. And that really is my number one thing because it was just instilled in me that we were experts and that we were right. And I really, really, really believed that. And then I thought when we changed that it meant we were wrong and it didn't mean we were wrong. So that's my number one thing. And again, thanks so much for including me. I love it. I, and I, I love a good list. So you're, you're also uh, right there, um, uh, you know, kind of speaking to my heart. Um, so thank you, Chief Garnett. Uh, you know, last but not least, and um, I kind of rearranged the order because I thought this would give me an opportunity as I introduce this next chief, because uh, this chief is also one of our newer uh, additions to the chief chair. Um, and was probably one of the last chiefs that I had an in-person, in-depth conversation with because uh, this time last year was our, was our uh, board meeting um, and it was just happening before the statewide shutdown and uh, Chief Katie Miller uh, from San Francisco Juvenile was, was uh, fairly new in her appointment uh, in that chair and I had an opportunity to meet uh, with her and, and talk to her because I didn't know her beforehand and 
uh, was really, really excited about it and just all the different things that I was learning from her and thinking, this is going to be great. This is really exciting. I can't wait to see her again. And then we shut down. So um, so I, I am looking forward to the day where I can see all of you again. But, um, but I, I thought that was interesting that you were one of the last um, in-person conversations uh, I remember having before the shutdown. So uh, Chief Miller, you uh, are, as I said, one of our newer chiefs uh, and uh, you have worked in San Francisco and San Diego, um, but in different capacities, not in the probation uh, world in, in all cases, which I think is also something that happens quite a bit in probation and, and is, a, is a good thing at our table at times. It, it kind of gives us, you know, more information, more perspectives to, to further improve the profession. Um, I love the quote, never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. And I cannot get over your fun fact that you once won a Harley Davidson motorcycle in a charity raffle. I think we will all want to know where it is and uh, at this point in your, your career, uh, but maybe you can save that in your, uh, in your question here. But uh, what motivated you to pursue a career in probation? <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you, Karen, for such a kind introduction. I also am looking forward to the day that we can actually talk in person and not just me calling you at strange hours uh, to complain and for support. Um, thank you to everybody for being on this panel. It's been so helpful to hear everybody, an awesome group of women. Uh, like Karen said, I haven't had a career in probation and, and her question to me was what motivated me to pursue one. Um, I think I would say it's kind of what Chief Eamon Krauss said. I said yes about a year ago to um, a sort of calculated risk. Um, but, you know, I'm a first time caller, long time listener <laughs> around probation. So I'm going to talk about what motivated me to uh, pursue a career in justice and especially youth justice. And I realized this is kind of like my five point manifesto, like to Chief Garnett's point. I think I also deal in fives. Um, you know, I, was, I spent uh, 51 very long weeks as a baby lawyer working in a corporate law firm, um, felt like 51 years. Uh, and ever since then, I've been working in the field of justice and especially youth justice. I have worked as a public defender. I have worked as a prosecutor for 12 years, worked in the mayor's office. I worked as a community reformer um, and now here and, and for all the same reasons. And here's why. Um, I believe deeply in the power of public service and in my personal obligation to serve. Um, I had the benefit of being raised in great privilege and I think it brings an obligation for me. I had the gift of nurturing home and parents who embarrassingly I think might be watching this right now. <laughs> um, I had access to a great education and I was really raised by my parents to never question that I could be at the tables of my choice. Um, and I think that's hugely important for me in every part of my career because I have often found myself in very new uncharted territory. Um, and I think it's also really important to always remember when you are raised in privilege that you have to bring humility to those tables in many, many ways. I also believe deeply in the promise of all of our kids um, and the frankly enormous return we get when we invest in their wellness and their future. I believe, and Karen and I were just talking about this maybe late last Friday night, that everyone should have a good experience with government, um, government of all kinds, and especially the justice system. I think people should experience it as a force for good. My own youth experiences taught me to trust school and police um, and that they worked for my well being and in my service. Um, and uh, I think those systems should work for all of us. And until they do, I don't actually really think they work for any of us. Um, there's a George Washington quote, it's in Hamilton, so this does not make me well read, it just makes me a uh, show fan, <laughs> but George Washington has an amazing quote where he talks about um, the benign influence of, a good, of good laws under a free government, and that is very meaningful to me in my work. I also believe in the power of relationships and that collaboration and connection actually make us greater than the sum of our parts, um, and I say all of these things because I say my final belief is that I actually think probation and especially juvenile probation uh, is the best place to put all of these beliefs into practice. Um, 
It's why I'm honored to be here. It's why it feels uh, so right for me in a time and space in the world that feels so hard and wrong in so many ways. Um, but I'm really honored to be here and I'm honored to be here with these amazing women today. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I can see the, all of the heads nodding, you know, as we're talking and, you know, there's so much, uh, you know, I, I think everybody is sharing. This is why I kind of thought this format would actually work. Um, I can tell you a couple of folks that you, you can't have 10 people on a panel. This isn't a panel, but you know, I knew that the the uh, the viewpoints, the information, the the questions, they would they would have a similar theme going back to the patterns as mentioned you know uh, earlier but be enriched by some of the different voices and so really appreciate um, all of you participating and our audience's um, patience in allowing us to kind of uh, try out this this new format uh, we did receive a couple of questions so now we get to really uh, do the speed dial kind of uh, part of our program today and so you all uh, see who can quickly hit their unmute button maybe um, and uh, don't all feel like you have to speak at uh, to answer uh, you know the question I think that that will seem a little bit repetitive if all 10 of you answer uh, your your uh, the same question but uh, but if you wouldn't mind um, just kind of if something speaks to you feeling free to to jump in but one thing that had come up in several questions that we received ahead of time and it came up already here today it certainly is something that's always been in the forefront of my mind um it is a a professional um is you know how do you get to work-life balance you know I, I if you notice we didn't we didn't start there we and and that was purposeful in 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 my opinion because i feel like that kind of sometimes is like the 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 thing that people use to to handicap women in in a, a career or a profession but you know i think it's quite the opposite i think it does give us um some things that uh that can be brought to a professional table. But I can tell based on the number of questions and in the way it was asked that our participants really would like to, to kind of hear a little bit about your thoughts on that. How do you balance it? How do you overcome the stigma that I just noted um, that sometimes does exist? And, and that's certainly not only for women. I mean, I think we are in a day and age where you know, especially if we're talking about children, you know, that that, uh, that fathers uh, run into some of this as well. But I think we also know that we do sometimes carry that burden in a workplace that, that seems as a negative. So um, any thoughts on, on those of you who have experienced it or nobody's trying to hit their mute button quick. You know, let me call on you like a teacher in class. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump in. <laughs> Um, just real quick, because I also went through um, years of infertility treatments in the same department um, that then I had kids in. And so that was also complicated in a small um, department. And it was, I mean, I just have to tell you, it was really, really hard. It's like, if I had to pick up my kids at daycare, people would audibly sigh. I mean, even though it was late, because I would just would always work late. That was just what I did. I always worked late. But when you have to pick your kids up, you actually do have to pick your kids up. But then I'd apologize for it and I would really feel bad and I would feel like I was letting people down because I was always there till seven. And the reality is I still went home and worked. Um, but here's what I did differently is like all of a sudden I just quit. I mean, frankly, when my, my male colleagues would say, well, I've got to leave early today to pick up my kids, which meant they were leaving at the regular time or I'm babysitting my kids or whatever, I'd just be like, well, wow. Um, and so I just started modeling that and then just expecting my male colleagues um, to do the same. So if somebody came in and said, my wife's pregnant, I said, oh, well, how long are you going to be taking off? When are you going to be taking off? Should we start planning the same way you do when a woman comes in and says, I'm pregnant? And you pull out the calendar and everybody's all focused. And, you know, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work. But um, after about a year of apologizing, I quit apologizing. Kind of a theme, right? Not to apologize for for being a, a woman, not to apologize for you know needing to find that work family balance in whatever way family manifests for you. And it's it's definitely um, it's hard. I mean, I, I know it's hard. I uh, I I too uh, right after my uh, my the birth of my daughter, I would go back and um, I would leave at you know five. 
and then come back at two in the morning to finish my work because this was the, the days that uh, you didn't have access to the to the computer internet systems the way you do now and you know you just didn't want to ask for you know the help or, or those kinds of things so um, it can be a burden we know for for everybody other thoughts anybody have anything else they want to add so I, I would just want to add that for those of you who are earlier in your career out there listening, your kids grow up fast and you don't get that time back. And I would say that's probably, if I had a regret, it's that when my kids were little, I didn't realize how fast that time was gonna go by. And one of the first facilities that I was assigned to as a superintendent for the Indiana Department of Correction was an hour and a half from my home base and I was nursing my infant son. But I couldn't say no, because it would have been professional suicide. It was a govern, government uh, governor appointment. And, and if I didn't say yes, they'd turn it over to someone else. And I wouldn't get that opportunity again for who knows how many years. So, you know, you, you tough it out, you pump, you drive in the snow and et cetera, et cetera. But you don't get those days back. And so while I cherish my career and I love that facility that I worked at, um, you don't get the time back. So try and sell, set healthier boundaries for yourself early on than I clearly did. Um, you know, get to know what your administration does and doesn't support and also try and surround yourself with the best support network, both of internal colleagues and friends and family at home that can help you, but really do realize that, you know, your family needs to be first. I always say when I'm speaking to new employees that this career can chew you up and spit you out if you're not careful and don't let your family become a casualty of your career. You know, and I'll say I couldn't agree more. Uh, you know, family is very important. Emotional wellness is important for us as women. And so is balancing, you know, your career with your life, spending, you know, quality time with other people outside of the profession, with your family. Um, that is really important. And one thing that I find that I do a lot is I go somewhere and I go paddle boarding in places where there is no cell service. And there's probably nobody else around except for the people that I'm with so that I am actually present and I'm actually there and I get that time away. I get that time unplugged and I get to just see some of the goodness that there is outside of work and being in touch with other people. So I think that that's really important. And I think that we should encourage people to do that more frequently. Unplugging is really, really important. Uh, Chief Baptista, I thought I saw your, your unmute button hit. Yes, thank you. Uh, just on, on that note, uh, as Issa was saying, you, the, the time goes by very, very quickly and your kids grow up very fast. I started my career a little bit later. Uh, I, was, I was in, I think, 32 when I finally started with probation. And uh, I, I, I have the perspective of being, I was a stay-at-home mom, the stay-at-home mom for a while. And when I chose that, when I quit a job to stay home with my kids, I got a lot of uh, a lot of pushback from wor working women who I got a lot of, aren't you bored? And, and wow, your career is really going to suffer and, and you should go back to work. And, and just like a lot, of, a lot of guilt, which was really upsetting. These are my colleagues, former colleagues and friends. And, and, and then when I went back to work, that I it turned in the other direction is wow you're going to leave your kids home alone and strangers are going to raise your children and I, I I just I was really struck by I we are all this where's the woman collaboration and the power and the support and either, there was sort of this no win situation so I choose what is right for you if you're if you're solid and you're on a career path stick with that. If you need to take time off, do that. The, the career will wait, the time passes, do what's right for you and your family and don't don't take into that outside guilt. And then as, as sisters in the movement, let's speak very careful to judge other people's choices and what they do because I it, it was just it was really alarming to get that feedback from both. And, and as you can see, my 10 year hiatus did not affect my career. So <laughs> Exactly. I was going to say something like, oh, you know, did you call them up when you got to the chief job to say and, this didn't turn look, out so bad? Exactly. And Chief Garnett's advice is so just just own it. And no, I need to do this for my family. And I think I think early on for some of us that was that was much harder. I think it's easier now. And 
and uh, and men are doing it as well. So then let's let's do that. Let's let's own that. Right. I think that's a great uh, advice, especially for those in a leadership role, management role. You know, it's you know I think often at some point in our our careers or lives, maybe a a male boss was doing something nice by going the extra mile to help out the mom, you know, and instead it should be, it should have been the same for the, for the father, the mother, the male, the female, it doesn't matter. It's, it's supposed to be a work-life balance and it's not that you need something extra because you're the, the, uh, the woman in the, the situation. So it's, it's really, um, really good advice. I think that a lot of folks were really interested in, in getting some answers to. So thank you for sharing that. Um, another question that um, has uh, shown up in a couple of places uh, in some form or fashion is, is really at what point in your career did you know that you wanted to become chief? And I'm sure a few of you are going to say, mm, I, I didn't say, and I, and I still don't know, <laughs> but, um, but I, I, I suspect that's not true in, in total, but what, what kind of, what was that point that kind of made you think that either you could do it, you wanted to do it, and I'm sure our participants are thinking, when should I be thinking about that, or if this is really a career choice for me, so any thoughts on that? Karen, can I just add a thought, this is Wendy. Please. I, I never ever intended to be a chief, you know, I 30 years in the prison system and executive level and and had an opportunity and this is what happens a lot of time my phone rang, you know, and said, Hey, would you think of coming in at, that happened in San Francisco and then it happened in Alameda. And, but what I realized is that I really wanted to have the opportunity to prevent people from going to prison, rather than trying to reform and rehabilitate inmates once they were in prison. But I think the important thing of that is, is to really understand women transferable your leadership skills are, right? And to not be afraid of taking on that role. I did things that I never thought, chief of reg, a regulation of policy, chief, uh, you know, managing a $9 billion budget, you know, with CDCR. And so it, it's really, um, you know, listening what your passion is and knowing that you can do it because the only reason you can is if you put a barrier in yourself and I will tell you so rewarding you know that I have never once regretted quite the opposite where I really felt kind of handcuffed within the prison system such a bureaucracy but then being able to go out to be the chief right and the only thing that stops you when you're chief is how creative you are you know how good are you at building relationships listening to your staff in your community, right? And so uh, anyways, I never knew I wanted to be chief, but I have found it to be a, probably the most rewarding uh, experience in, in my entire 40 year career. That's, that's, that's exciting to hear, right? You know, you've, you kind of, uh, I always am so happy to hear that, especially upon retirement. So people say this was really the pinnacle. This is really what I wanted to do because so many chiefs do say, I really didn't know. I kind of got, you, you often get tapped on the shoulder, right? Is, is kind of the, uh, the history and not that there's anything wrong with if you kind of knew after you know you gave up your dream of being a forest ranger that this was the, the, the general direction that you wanted to go in and then you go after it that's a good thing too but but it is a pretty common story I would say um, many uh, many chiefs and probably more so in the female uh, that don't didn't really set out to be chief usually but any other thoughts on that from others or have different experience I'll jump Chief in Miller. there, Karen. Oh, Chief. Yes, Chief Hyman. Um, you know, I uh, every step along the way, I think I stumbled into um, the next opportunity. Truly, um, coming into the field of uh, probation, I honestly didn't know what I was um, getting into when I applied for the job. Um, it was back in the day where you looked at the classifieds. I know many um, won't uh, uh, be familiar with that experience. But I responded to a classified that didn't say anything about probation, didn't say anything about 
um, peace officer or law enforcement. It talked about a 24 hour institution working with um, uh, adolescents. And that was something I had done before at a psychiatric hospital. And I just kind of stumbled into it. And when I realized what it was, I thought, oh, I'm in over my head. But every step of the way I um, committed to the step I was at to be the best that I could be in whatever position that I was in. And I think there's a lot of different paths to being uh, a chief, as you mentioned, some that set their eye on it and um, work towards it. That's a admirable way um, to have it happen. But if you happen to be somebody that stumbles into it along the way, that's okay too. As long as wherever you are, you're giving it your best, committed to advancing your skills and giving back to the, to the position and the profession as much as you can, oftentimes then, you know, it's just going to lead to you being uh, given those opportunities um, that maybe you didn't plan for or weren't expecting. Um, the other thing I just have to say is that sometimes we do apply for promotional opportunities. Over the course of my career, there were times when I thought, oh, okay, I'll stick my name in the hat for that. And it didn't work out. Um, I was encouraged um, the first time I applied for, for a chief, I was encouraged by my retiring chief. Uh, she really wanted me to put my name in the hat. So I did, and it didn't work out. I didn't get the position. And I thought, well, that, that, that's fine. I am enjoying what I'm doing now. Um, and I'll just keep doing what I'm doing now as, as best as I can. And then out of the blue, I ended up getting an opportunity for chief um, and uh, wasn't expecting it, um, didn't apply for it, but was asked to take the job. So you just never know how these things are going to come about. And I think it's about being committed to what you're doing and just keep doing the best that you can. And you never know where it's going to going to lead, but it will always lead to good places if you give it your your best. I think that's really uh, spot on advice. Uh, Chief Miller, did you have some thoughts on this one too? Sure, I was trying to think of an eloquent way to say this, but there isn't one. Um, for me, it was really like a put up or shut up moment. I had a lot of kind of thoughts and ideas and impatience about what I wanted to see happen in San Francisco's juvenile justice system. Um, and then I was offered the opportunity to be in this space and do it. And I had to tell myself, if you don't do it, you need to stop kind of um, commenting from the sidelines, right? Like get in the arena, get out of the bleachers. This is the moment where you do it or you don't. And so it was kind of the nudge I needed. But I would also add to Chief Heitman's comments, um, I'm grateful for the jobs I never got. It, was, it worked out fine. For me, my path um, was the right path. And I think it's really hard to have that long view um, and it's easy to look at it from later and see how much it all made sense. And sometimes it's okay to, to not feel like it's a straight path that makes sense when you're in it. Yeah, that's a, uh, you know what it's starting to sound like to me, like you fall in love when you're not looking for it, right? And that does seem to be the pathway to chief. Uh, the other thing, unfortunately, showing my age, um, I have been in a lot of the trainings that are, are kind of training the, the next generation. You know, it used to be command college. Now we have the manager's leadership academy and uh, supervisor's leadership academy. And, you know, when people are doing what's just been described here, it, you, others see it. And it, it almost never surprises me when, when somebody who has been in some of those classes that, you know, I've had the opportunity to interact with or work with, you know, it's like, yeah, of course they, they would have been chosen as chief. There's just, you know, staying focused on, on the job at hand and caring about doing it well is usually the recipe for success. Any other thoughts on that one before we take, I think we might have time for one more question. Karen, I think it's just really about um, taking advantage of the opportunities. And I know a couple of uh, the chiefs on the panel have discussed that, but however you get there, whether you, you start out really wanting to end up in that spot or you fall into it, um, it's really about your reputation is who you are every single day, not when you're applying for the next step, right? So I think building that relationship with people in your um, business area and really taking advantage of all the opportunities for promotion as they come, I think that really tells you if you're going to be ready for the next step and if you even want to be ready for the next step, right? Because 
starting uh, at certain levels, right, all the politics starts to play into things in terms of what you will have to deal with as a chief. And I think you learn so much along the way as you take advantage of the opportunities, but it's so important not to hold yourself back to wait till somebody taps you on the shoulder and asks, right? Be, be forward enough and brave enough to step up and, and try it, right? And, and you're never gonna know until you do that. More great advice because you know it's it's uh, it's all out there to, to have, and you know we're getting a lot of comments about you know how inspirational this talk is for for folks who are are tuning in, and that's and that really is I think the whole point of the the month of March. It's the whole point that I know is really important to all of you around the table. I think that we um, you know once women do get into a place of leadership, there's been very few, no matter what the profession, you know, who do, doesn't feel responsibility to help those, uh, you know, also get to the pinnacle of what whatever they want in their uh, career and life. And so it's a, it, if you give back, you know, you really do see that the benefit of that. Um, and I think women in probation in particular, I don't know, I've often asked, I have no idea what, draws the, the the best of the best to this profession, but it seems like we're really lucky in probation. It, it, it does, your pathways are all different, um, whether it's chief or, or, or other people in probation, there's something special about probation. There's something special in the probation water about people who work for probation. And uh, so I hope that uh, everybody uh, tuned in and enjoyed this conversation. I know it has been the highlight of not only my day, but my month, probably my year, uh, even though it was virtual. And I think we've all kind of been a little tired of that. Uh, it, this gave us an opportunity to all just uh, kind of share uh, these thoughts in a, in a way and maybe reached, we had, you know, 500 people or so at uh, different times on this call and um, or this webinar. So you probably touched quite a few. Uh, so with that, um, any final comments before we draw to a close? Just really want to thank you all. I just really, uh, I get to, to sit with you all quite a bit and uh, I feel really fortunate to have access to such inspirational leaders. Uh, it was really nice to be able to share that with uh, others. So thank you again and everybody have a wonderful rest of your Friday and enjoy the month of March. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, thank Karen. You, Thanks, Karen. Thanks everyone.